Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, I promised we would uh, start talking about all these respiratory viruses that are now in season. Uh, sort of mid, mid part of September is the official uh, beginning of the respiratory uh, sort of uh, respiratory illness season. And the main viruses we're going to be tracking are RSV, coronavirus, and flu. Uh, and we're, we're it's still pretty low, but just beginning to creep up. Coronavirus is beginning to come up a bit. Flu hasn't really taken off. But I promised uh, a few weeks ago that we would have a, a visit with some of the leaders of our uh, uh, Baylor Vaccine and, uh, and Treatment Unit, Treatment Evaluation Unit. And we're lucky. Uh, the uh, uh, Mary Dickinson is the Senior Vice President and Dean for Research is going to interview uh, Tony Piedro, who's one of the leaders of that uh, Vaccine Treatment Unit. So it's a really exciting uh, time, a wonderful time to, to learn about all the things that go on about developing vaccines and evaluating how effective they are, how they're developed, uh, and we'll be doing that today. So come join me and uh, let's go listen to that interview. Hi, I'm Mary Dickinson, the Dean of Research at Baylor College of Medicine. And today I'm here with Tony Piedra. He's one of our outstanding faculty members in the Vaccine Trial and Evaluation Unit. And we're gonna talk about the upcoming flu season. So that's an exciting thing for all of us to pay attention to as we protect ourselves against, uh, against the flu virus and continue to keep ourselves healthy and active. So Tony, I have a bunch of questions for you. I'm ready. Awesome. The flu this season, are we looking at a tough flu season? If I had to predict, I think we're going to have a moderate influenza season and it's going to be dominated by the H1N1 virus and flu B. We all know that vaccines are very important to protect ourselves against the flu. When's the best time to get the vaccine? The, the best time to get vaccinated is probably September, October, November. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it's recommended for all individuals six months of age and older. And so to vaccinate in a very short time, it's very difficult. And so when the influenza vaccine is available, and it will be available soon, I would say for healthy individuals, go ahead and get vaccinated. For individuals who are at greater risk, timing, you may want to think about timing for optimal protection, but I would definitely be vaccinated by October. You never know when flu arrives. For infants who have never, or children under eight years of age who have never received a flu vaccine, they need two doses. So now it's a time to get vaccinated. And the other groups that should be paying attention to this closely, those other at-risk risk groups, can you just review those at-risk folks? For sure. Well, we know that there are individual groups that are higher risk for hospitalization and also from death. So individuals 65 years of age and older is a special group because the vaccine, the influenza vaccine that's recommended for them, it's a bit different. Mm -hmm. They need either an adjuvant or a higher dose vaccine to get that extra boost in providing immunity. For other folks, then there's really a variety of flu vaccines that they can choose, select from, and it's good to talk to your physician. And then another group not to forget is the pregnant mother, or the pregnant woman. Uh, and they are recommended to receive the flu vaccine anytime. Mm -hmm. And if they're during the third trimester, get vaccinated now so that you can provide some degree of protection also for the infant. Great. So since you are in the vaccine treatment and evaluation unit, can you tell us a little bit about how these vaccines are formulated and how they're tested? So the influenza vaccine strains are selected by the World Health Organization in the month of February, generally. And they have really worldwide surveillance to know what's happening, what new uh, strain may be out there. Mm -hmm. And so the selection in February occurs for the Northern Hemisphere. There's also a Southern Hemisphere vaccine and that occurs a little bit later. In March, uh, the FDA with VRPAC, the Vaccine and Related Biological Product Advisory Committee, it's a mouthful, they meet to basically say, okay, the strains that were selected by World Health Organization were in agreement and those are going to be the, the strains that are going to be included this year. Then there's one other, the ACIP, the Advisory Board uh, for Immunization Prevention by the CDC, that makes the recommendation on how to utilize 
this plethora of flu vaccines that we have. Mm -hmm. And so the vaccine that I get at my Walgreens versus the vaccine that somebody gets in their doctor's office, are these all the same vaccines? There are about three or four different major vaccine manufacturers for influenza vaccines. Mm -hmm. And they're formulated a little bit different, but in general, the principle is that they will have all four antigens, an H3N2, an H1N1, and two different flu B lineages. And then it depends on whether it's going to be tailored for the older adult, that would be either adjuvanted uh, or higher dose, or whether it's going to be tailored for the standard individual. And there you have formulations that are either grown in a mammalian cell line or are egg-based or recombinant. And those are produced by different manufacturers. And likewise, the live attenuated flu vaccine. That's great. That's it's fascinating. I know that the flu virus is very um, promiscuous, has a lot of uh, adaptability to the environment. And with multiple strains floating around, it's, it's always a question of how effective the vaccine is going to be. One is having to make a best guess as to what strains are going to be circulating and in what proportion. And sometimes that best guess is not the realization of what occurs. Mm -hmm. But you have to make that best guess early enough so that the manufacturers can prepare the vaccine on time and have it available for the upcoming influenza season. In general, the vaccines will have somewhere between 40 to 70 percent effectiveness. And they are more efficacious against more severe disease compared to the milder disease. If there is breakthrough infections, there's always antivirals that are available. Oh, yeah. I would love to talk about the antivirals because I think they're really interesting in this space. And we've talked a lot about those for COVID. But I think that the antivirals in, in the flu space are not as well understood or, or people are still confused about when to engage and take those. But there are, you could say, in the United States, two major antivirals. Uh, one is a neuraminidase inhibitor and the other is a polymerase inhibitor, two major classes. So those two major classes, can you maybe give us some of the, the regular trade names so that people identify with what you're, yes. what you're talking about? Yes, for the neuraminidase inhibitor, the one that is best known is also Tamivir or it comes as Tamiflu. Tamiflu. And that's taken twice a day for five days. If you're a standard individual, healthy or, or have high risk, it changes if you're immunocompromised. For the polymerase inhibitor, it's baloxavir, and it's a one-dose treatment, and that's it. And uh, the, for both of these major classes of antivirals, the earlier you start treatment, the more effective the outcome. And so normally from an outpatient, not from an inpatient or hospitalized case, but if you're being treated on an outpatient basis, you like to be treated within 48 hours of illness onset. That can be difficult in, in our current health care. And so what I advocate is that, especially for those who are at risk, older folks, individuals with asthma or heart disease or diabetes or other chronic complications, that they or children, children under five years of age, either the parents or the adults should be talking to their physician and say, okay, what's the strategy so that I can get an antiviral against flu quickly? And I can have it basically to the pharmacist and maybe treat, start treatment within 24 hours of illness onset. And those type of discussions need to happen now because what normally happens is by the time they notify their doctor, the doctor gets back, it's already past two days, and the antivirals are not going to be that effective for so, outpatient. So that's a big question. So where can you get tested to see if you have the flu and to see if you are... Um, a possible patient that could benefit from Tamiflu or, or some of these approaches? So that one is a little bit more difficult because there are home tests mm -hmm. for SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. For influenza, there are not that many point-of-care tests. Things are a little bit different now because we have SARS-CoV-2, we have influenza, and we have RSV that can all circulate at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so at least ruling out SARS-CoV-2 would be useful. Uh, and if you know that flu is here in the community, then you may start it, consider impaired treatment if you're not able to get a, a rapid point-of-care test. Um, 
what measures can you take to prevent others in your household from getting sick or let's say others in your workplace or others in your school? If we're able to have high vaccination coverage, it's one of the best ways to help dampen the spread of the virus. And we had done studies many years ago demonstrating that school-based vaccination is a very effective way to help curtail the spread of influenza within the school environment and the community. So improving our vaccination coverage among the family, among children, among those that are recommended, and that's everybody six months of age and older for the most part, mm -hmm. will really have a, a mitigating effect against the spread of influenza. The other, as we have already learned, we know that non-pharmaceutical interventions can also be very important. And that can help complement, especially those who are at higher risk, not only against influenza, but other viruses that may co-circulate at the same time. And that's wearing a mask, having some degree of social distancing if, if you're in, in, in fact very debilitated, immunocompromised for one reason or the other. So think vaccines, first pillar, but also think about non-pharmaceutical interventions as a second pillar and as a third antivirals. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what RSV is and how it spreads and why we should be paying attention to it this year. Absolutely. Respiratory syncytial virus or RSV is the number one virus for infants under five years of age. It causes the most amount of hospitalizations, pneumonia, bronchiolitis, you name it, it has a major impact on infants and young children. For older adults, it's kind of like second to influenza. And now you could say to SARS-CoV-2. And so RSV circulates during a similar time as influenza and also causes significant amount of hospitalization and deaths uh, in older adults. And like influenza and SARS-CoV-2, it can have long-term morbidity and mortality. There have been some very nice studies to demonstrate that after the acute infection, we know it as long COVID, but I'll just say there's long RSV and there's long influenza, mm -hmm. that in the subsequent year, those individuals are actually at higher risk for dying from complications. So, so we've had a major breakthrough this year. Mm -hmm. For the first time ever, we have RSV vaccines and they are right now the, the two, they're protein-based, kind of like influenza vaccines, protein-based. And they're available for adults 60 years of age and older. Mm -hmm. So they have been approved for, for older adults. Mm -hmm. For infants uh, under a, a year of age, we have a monoclonal antibody, which is different than a vaccine. A monoclonal antibody contains the ingredient that a vaccine is going to induce in your body. So it contains the antibody at a high enough level to protect. And this one is called nercivimab. It's a long-acting monoclonal antibody that can protect over a five-month period over the RSV season. Anything that people can do to help protect the, the folks and their family from RSV? And how are the symptoms maybe different from the flu or COVID that would help people to recognize RSV? It is very difficult. It is very difficult to distinguish RSV from influenza, from COVID, even mm -hmm. COVID. The important part would be to understand what's circulating in the community, mm -hmm. because that will tell you better what is the virus that you're more likely to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are tests that are available uh, that one can at least test for RSV, influenza, and SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The symptoms of RSV, like flu, are oftentimes a cough. They may or may not have a fever. They ha will have a sore throat, runny nose congestion, and it may go to their chest. And there they can cough, wheeze, have some respiratory distress. And that's what puts you into complications into the hospital. It's generally difficulty breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and like influenza, RSV does the same thing. RSV causes a little bit more wheezing type illness, mm -hmm. but again, it's very difficult to distinguish one from the other. And so if we get SARS-CoV-2 and then RSV, you've really increased the illness burden as compared to if you just get one or the other. And so being protected by vaccination, being aware of utilization of antivirals for influenza and SARS-CoV-2, 
and understanding that there are non-pharmaceutical interventions that we can utilize mm -hmm. to reduce the burden of illnesses, mm -hmm. especially in those greatest at risk. And it is possible to have all three at once? So, so that is unusual. Uh -huh. uh, it means that all the viruses have to be circulating <laughs> at once, and that has happened. Uh -huh. So the answer is yes, it's possible. So tell me, uh, tell our viewers about the VTEU and what they do and how the VTEU um, partners with other groups to ensure that we have safe, effective vaccines. So the VTEU stands for Vaccine and Treatment Evaluation Unit. Mm -hmm. They're a special unit, there's 10 of them in the United States, where they can either act together as one or separate, depending on the study. Mm -hmm. And they are really what I would say a jewel for the healthcare system because they help develop vaccines, especially early in their development. Mm -hmm. And with the SARS-CoV-2, they were instrumental in ensuring that the U.S. had licensed messenger RNA vaccines available to combat uh, SARS-CoV-2. So they play a very important role in ensuring a healthy supply of vaccines mm -hmm. by testing them early uh, and evaluating them and making sure that they can kind of move what I would call the ladder of vaccine development. Mm -hmm. Well, we're certainly proud of the work that the VTU does here at Baylor and they're not only a jewel for the country, but certainly a jewel for us. And it's we're so grateful to have you all here. I would just like to say that Dr. Hannah El Sali is mm -hmm. the principal investigator of the Vaccine Treatment Evaluation Unit. And she really guided us during this pandemic period, yeah. which was pretty intense. Well, we want to thank you for your attention and for viewing this video. I hope that it's been helpful to you. I've certainly enjoyed talking to Dr. Piedra and have learned a lot from this conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Well, that was really great. Uh, learned so much about our vaccine treatment unit. Uh, thank you so much to Mary and Tony for uh, spending the time so everyone could hear what's going on. Uh, it's apropos to also uh, re recognize that the FDA just approved uh, COVID vaccines uh, by Pfizer and uh, Moderna. So they should be, uh, the coronavirus vaccine should be available uh, very soon. And uh, as soon as they're available, actually, uh, we should probably start uh, getting those boosters. And we'll talk a little bit more about flu, uh, the flu vaccines and when to get them. But it's getting very close to that time. I, again, I've said many times, we peaked seasons about December, late December. So we usually recommend uh, mid middle of September to early October getting your vaccines. I want to end today with a couple of shout outs. First of all, I want to congratulate all the recipients of the 2023 Michael DeBakey Excellence in Research Awards. These are faculty members who've had outstanding research publications over the past year. The honorees this year are uh, Dr. Olivia, uh, Olivier Lichtarge, Professor of Molecular and Human Genetics and Biochemistry and Molecular Pharmacology. Uh, Dr. Daisuke Nakata, Professor of Molecular and Human Genetics. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Rogers, the Associate Professor of Molecular and Human Genetics. Dr. Fritz uh, Sedlicek, Associate Professor of Molecular and Human Genetics, and finally, uh, Dr. Francois St. Pierre, Assistant Pro Professor of Neuroscience of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Also something of interest, we have started in the Department of Dermatology uh, a skin uh, of color clinic. This provides personalized and culturally sensitive care to, uh, to people who have skin disease with all different ethnicities, uh, skin tones, and hair texture. Uh, this is often overlooked in people with darker skin, so this is a real great opportunity for people to make sure that they're getting their, uh, their, skin, ca their skin care and cancer screening. And finally, of course, uh, today, this evening, uh, is the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, the celebration of uh, the new year, and it starts tonight and Sunday. And I want to uh, give a giant shout out, Happy New Year to all of our friends and colleagues celebrating Rosh Hashanah, Shana Tova. Uh, and I can't wait to see you next week.